Hi, welcome back to the Bible Overview Series. My name's Ryan Quick. I'm a pastor here at Eaton Baptist Church, and you're here for part two of six of the Bible Overview Series. If you haven't seen part one, I encourage you to go back and have a look at it. What we looked at was understanding the whole big picture of the Bible, beginning on the left and moving to the right, seeing it as a timeline. Today, we want to start asking the question, how does the Bible overview itself? How does the Bible overview itself. Well, one of the ways that the Bible overviews itself is through genealogies. You know those long, boring lists of names that you skip over when you're reading in the Bible? That's one of the ways that the Bible overviews itself, and they're there for a very important reason. Let me give you three. The first is genealogies act like an ancient passport. They clarify someone's identity. So you're that person. Oh, the son of that person, the son of that person. It locates someone in a place and a time, and it's their um, validation for who they are. It's their identification. That's reason number one. Reason number two, it's an ancient form of validating a story. So I'm telling you a story about these people in this time that they did those things. You don't believe me? Well, go and chat with these people that come from this family line. It's a way of verifying what they said. Point number three... It's an overview of what happened. Simply by telling the story, by telling the names of the people in the story, the characters, you know a little bit about what's going to happen. So think about it. We still do this today. What happens at the end and often at the beginning of most movies, we have a little bit of credits. You know a little bit of what the story is going to be like because you know that director. Oh, they also directed those movies. I know a little bit of what this is going to be like. Oh, Robert Downey Jr. is in this. Oh, I know what it's going to be about a little bit, right? Because of some of the characters in the story, you make inferences about what the story is going to be about. And the same is true with genealogies. Because you know the names, you remember their stories, and so you can remember the whole big story just by the names. And what we see in the Bible is that genealogies are placed at really important moments in the big story. Genesis chapter 5, we have a long list of names that gives us the names from Adam to Noah, from the fall to the flood. Then in Genesis chapter 10, we get a list of names that outline for us all the nations, all the ethnicities that are going to then occur in the rest of the Bible story. They can be traced back to Genesis chapter 10. Some people call it the table of nations. And it puts forward for us a, a movement there between Noah and Abraham. See, they put, they put it really important moments in the story. Same with Moses. After the Exodus, when they get into the Mount Sinai region, they have a, a, an opportunity to have a genealogy. They count the people they have. And same when they get into the Promised Land. Under David, they have a genealogy, an account of the people that are there. And so it shouldn't surprise us that the New Testament opens with genealogies. After 400 years of silence from heaven, Matthew pens his gospel beginning with the names of the people who've come before. Just read them with me. And what I want you to do is you just put the names on the screen here, is I want you just to remember with each of the names the stories that are associated with them. Let me read it to you. Matthew chapter 1, verses 1 to 17. He opens his gospel this way. This is the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. See, Jesus here is getting set up as a son of Abraham, a son of the promise, a son creating the new family of God, and a son of David. All the promises that were given to David is now going to become true in Jesus. And it goes forward. Abraham was the father of Isaac. Isaac, the father of Jacob. Jacob, the father of Judah and his brothers. And Judah, the father of Perez. And Zerah by Tamar. Boaz by Rahab. And Boaz, the father of Obed, by Ruth, and David was the father of Solomon by the wife of Uriah. Josiah, the father of Jeconiah and his brothers at the time of the exile. And after the exile to Babylon, Jeconiah was the father of Shealtiel. And then right down at the end of the list, Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom Jesus was born, who is called Christ. See, in this genealogy, as Matthew sets up his gospel, he reminds you of the names of the significant characters that have gone before to remind you of the big storyline of the Bible. And woven in is five interesting women. 
in this story because part of the point is this Messiah is meant to come as a seed of the woman that these Gentiles have been woven into the family of God. That's exactly what Jesus is going to do. The seed of the woman is going to crush the snake and weave in Gentiles into the Israelite story. Incredible. Even in the genealogy, the gospel and the Bible story are all getting woven together. And it's connected to the significant events. We have Abraham, we have David, we have exile. It doesn't just happen in Matthew's gospel, it also happens right near the beginning of Luke's gospel. Luke chapter 3, verses 23 to 38. Jesus, when he began his ministry, was about 30 years of age, being the son, as was supposed, of Joseph, the son of Zerubbabel. That's the guy that came out of exile. The son of Nathan, the son of David, the son of Judah, the son of Jacob, the son of Isaac, the son of Abraham, the son of Noah, the son of Adam, the son of God. So the significance here is that Jesus is getting lined up with these people. Jesus is a son of Zerubbabel. He's going to lead Israel, the new Israel, out of a spiritual exile. Jesus is the son of David. He's going to be the king that furthers David's line. Jesus is a son of Judah because the scepter was promised to Judah's line, the one who's going to rule Israel. Jesus is a son of Noah because Jesus is going to experience a flood-like decreation on the cross, that there may be a recreation of all people through his saving work against sin. Jesus is a new son of Adam. He's a new humanity. Jesus is the son of God. He's the full and complete son of God, winning humanity back through adoption. So remember, first uh, Bible overview we looked at was a timeline going from left to right. The second one we've looked at is going top down. It's working the other direction. So there's some positives here, thinking about it this way. It's simple to remember names and to remember the events that happened to them. Abraham, you remember the stories. Son of Abraham had many sons. I won't sing any more. I'll save you of it. But you remember the stories. And David, see these characters, they remind you of the stories. It highlights the characteristic of God as well. God is faithful through the generations, even when people are faithless. And it's historically viable. These people, we know they existed. We have archaeological evidence. We have physical evidence. We have historical data. These people existed. So it's historically viable. So there's some positives. There's also some negatives. Can we just be real? A long list of names are boring. Aren't they? I mean, they just are. And so it's a little bit hard to connect with that as well. We tend to skip through them. All of those stories initially are a little bit boring to read those list of names, but they're deeply important. It forces us into a meditation style of reading. We read and reread. It forces us to reread the Bible for a lifetime. And honestly, that's good for us. If you want to think about studying this way of reading the Bible further, one book that I'd encourage you to read is a children's Bible. It's a really quick way to to remember all of the major stories to these major characters. And one of the other ways to do it is have a deep read of Hebrews chapter 11. I'm just going to read it out to you. It's going to be up on the screen. And I want you to just see how Jesus is woven into as the central point of the whole Bible story. Hebrews chapter 11. By faith, Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain. By faith, Enoch was taken up so that he should not see death. By faith, Noah, being warned by God concerning events as yet unseen, in reverent fear constructed an ark for the saving of his household. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. By faith, Sarah herself received power to conceive even when she was past the age since since she considered him faithful who had promised by faith abraham when he was tested offered up isaac by faith isaac invoked future blessings on jacob and esau by faith jacob when dying blessed each of his sons of Joseph, bowing in worship over the head of his staff. By faith, Joseph, at the end of his life, made mention of the exodus of the Israelites and gave direction concerning his bones. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden for three months by his parents because they saw that the child was beautiful and they were not afraid of the king's edict. By faith, Moses, when he was grown up, refused 
to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to be mistreated with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. By faith, the people crossed the Red Sea as on dry land, but the Egyptians, when they attempted to do the same, were drowned. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell down after they'd been encircled for seven days. By faith, Rahab the prostitute did not perish with those who were disobedient because she had given a friendly welcome to the spies. And what more shall I say? For time would fail me to tell you of Gideon, of Barak, of Samson, of Jephthah, of David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, enforced justice, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, were made strong out of weakness, became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight. Women received back their dead by resurrection. Some were tortured refusing to accept release so that they might rise again to a better life. Others suffered mocking and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawn in two. They were killed with the sword. They went about in skins of sheep and goats, destitute, afflicted, mistreated, of whom the world was not worthy, wandering about in deserts and mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. And all these, though commended, through their faith, did not receive what was promised, since God has provided something better for us, that apart from us they should not be made perfect. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance, the race that is set before us. We look to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and is seated now at the right hand of the throne of God. See, the Bible is all about Jesus. The faith of these Old Testament people is resting on Jesus and so is our faith. See, these long lists of names are not about your name. It's about the name, the name of Jesus. And if your faith is in the name, then your name gets to join that list. That's good news. And so we remember the big view of Scripture, the broad brushstrokes, so that we may understand the finer details. Our first way of doing so is with a timeline left to right. Our second way is top down because the big idea is Jesus, his life, his death, his burial, his resurrection. Is your name on the list because you trust that that list is all about the name, Jesus? God bless you as you study the word of God. We'll see you again soon.